was a beautiful little video. I hope you could, um, with his strong accent, hear the couple of little stories he told, especially the connection um, that generosity creates. Uh, we, over the years, you, have been generous enough to allow us to help and send funds to the Czech Republic, and then that uh, church was able to work on a new sanctuary project, and through that project, that man, that 50-year-old man, became generous himself and then help them finish that building. And so your generosity created his generosity a whole culture and half the world away. So that's a great story. That's a story that we are all a part of. And that leads into what we're going to talk about today. Well, a number of years ago, uh, one of our boys, who was just six or seven years old at the time, spent a Saturday morning raking leaves for a neighbor. And for that couple hours of work, uh, the neighbor paid him the um, exorbitant, generous, astronomical sum of $5. So suddenly, my little son was a rich man. Well, the next day was Sunday. And so we came to church here at South Street. It was the only campus we had at that time. And uh, after church, I had that particular son with me. And one of our little traditions back in those days was when we would leave church, I would take one or more of the boys, and we would stop by the pantry that used to be right across the street from Chapel Street. Remember, the Pepper Valley Pantry used to be right over there, so on the way out, I would just drive right there, we'd go in, we'd pick up, you know, a little snack to hold us over till Sunday dinner, you know, some Twizzlers or some, some candy bars or something, uh, Skittles, and so we went into the store, and as soon as we got into the store, the son who had the $5 burning a hole in his pocket said, Dad, Dad, can I buy something with my own money? I said, sure, bud, it's your money, buy whatever you want. He comes back like a minute later, I think with a Snickers bar, which made sense to me, and one of those little paper roses in a plastic tube. You must have seen them stacked up at the counter. You know what I'm talking about? They look like that. And I was kind of surprised. I said, what's with, what do you want, what's with the flower? And he said, I want to give it to mom. And I said, but it's $2.99. Why would you want to do that? <laughs> I have a, just two questions about that little story. One is, uh, what is wrong with me? Uh, why would I even ask that? What, what could possibly be the downside of a six-year-old boy giving his mom a paper flower at the costume? I mean, she might even think I put him up to it and I get a little bounce back, you know, appreciation. <laughs> Secondly, more importantly, how could my little son see an opportunity for generosity that I couldn't see? How is that possible? I'll come back to that question in just a minute. We're in the third week of a summer series that we're calling the Disciplines of Grace. And you remember a couple of weeks ago in week one, we started with the Discipline of Gratitude. And we're coming up with a challenge for you every uh, week of this series to build in spiritual disciplines and rhythms into your life. And the challenge that week was to spend some time every day just thinking about things for which you are profoundly grateful and listing them down, five things a day, different things every day. And I got some emails from people, got some text messages, who, people who sent me their lists on several different days. And that was fun. I did it myself. Last week, you were challenged to, at the end of the day, think back to where you saw God at work during that day, paying attention to what God has been doing, noticing. And today, we're going to talk about the discipline or the grace of generosity. And by the way, some of you have already noticed this, but as we go through the series and we give you these challenges, you don't have to stop doing one to do the next one. Uh, they are intended to build on each other, so we build these rhythms into our lives. But today we're talking about the grace of generosity. We're going to look at a passage in 2 Corinthians uh, in the New Testament. This is an ancient letter written by the Apostle Paul to a group of believers in the ancient city of Corinth. Now, let me give you just a little bit of background about Corinth. It was located in the part of the world that today we would call Greece, um, right in the middle of the Roman Empire. You can see it right in the middle of that screen, Corinth there. Not far from Athens to the east, the great city, um, some 800 miles northwest of where Jerusalem would have been. But Corinth is located, you'll see, right on a skinny stretch of land, an isthmus between two bodies of water, which made it, made it perfect for the shipping industry, for commerce. I'll talk more about that in just a moment. Paul had played a huge role in planting that church in Corinth. You can read about that in Acts chapter 18. But when you read 1st and 2nd Corinthians, it, you find out pretty quickly that that church in the first century had lots of issues. 
And some of those issues came about because these were people coming to faith out of all kinds of pagan backgrounds. And so Paul had to correct doctrinal issues. They had blended mythology and, 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 and other kinds of belief systems with the gospel. He had to deal with all kinds of behavior issues. But it was also a relatively affluent church. Uh, meaning that the Corinthians tended to be affluent people because of all the commerce and business that came through their city. Uh, one historian called ancient Corinth the equivalent of a modern-day uh, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, and New York all rolled into one city. So it's an interesting place. And one of the purposes of this, second, uh, this letter to the Corinthians is to encourage them, the affluent Corinthians, to participate in an offering a kind of love offering that Paul is collecting from all the churches to send back to Jerusalem, a church that was struggling greatly and under great persecution. So he's wanting to encourage them. In the previous chapter, in chapter 8, verse 1, Paul says, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace God has given the Macedonian churches. Notice that word grace. We'll come back to it. Macedonia was a region north of Corinth, where the church there was also known to be relatively poor. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, even beyond their ability. So he's writing the Corinthians and using the Macedonian church, a much less affluent church, as an example of generosity. Notice he says, even though they were struggling with poverty... Uh, their joy overflowed into great generosity. This would be like, imagine Paul writing to us as the church in suburban North America, one of the most affluent places in the world, and encouraging us to give a gift to, let's say, a struggling church in Mexico, and using a church in Haiti as an example who's already given beyond their means. This is what Paul is doing here. He refers to their generosity as a grace. And then he challenges the Corinthians to match this grace. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7 says, But since you excel in everything, in faith, in knowledge, in speech, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled for you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. And then in chapter 9, the passage we're going to read today, Paul goes on to teach them about the grace of generosity. 2 Corinthians 9 beginning in verse 6. Paul writes, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Paul here is teaching the Corinthians and us four things, I think, today. First, he's teaching them what I would call the principle of the harvest. The principle of the harvest. Uh, years ago, when my wife Lorena and I had the opportunity to, uh, to build, have a, ho a home built for the first time, the builder or developer offered us um, a choice when it came to our, our front yard. We could uh, have it sodded at a cost of, I think, $1,400. Or we could take a credit for that and just seed it ourselves. So I thought to myself, you know, $1,400 is $1,400. How hard can seeding a yard be? <laughs> and uh, I found out. After three days or so of uh, taking the weed whacker, and, we and because the weeds were like that tall at that time, whacking all the weeds down and using weed killer on everything, then, then sumo wrestling with a rototiller, for a whole day, almost killed myself, and taking out like a small mountain of rocks and getting them out of my yard, I learned exactly how hard it is to seed a yard. And then I needed grass seed. I thought to myself, well, grass seed's a grass seed, right? Went to a hardware store, uh, bought a couple of bags of the cheapest grass seed I could find, bought one of those little plastic spreader things, you know, and then walked, spent a day walking around my yard, 
you know, spreading out the grass seed, got a bunch of hay, and watered like crazy for about three weeks. And three weeks later, I had the finest patch of mud and hay <laughs> in the entire neighborhood. And very low self-esteem. Um, I found out how hard it is. I found out what the law of harvest is all about. Paul writes, verse 6, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. I don't know how many farmers are here, or those of you who grew up on a farm, but every farmer understands the law of the harvest. It takes seven and a half pounds of corn seed to produce 120 bushels of corn at the end of the harvest. Every farmer knows this. You reap what you sow. You sow abundant seed, you reap abundant crop. You sow a little bit of seed, you reap a little crop. Or in my case, you sow cheap seed, you're going to raise a lousy lawn. Now the principle of the harvest applies to lots of areas of our lives. Education, for example. If you sow sparingly with regard to education, you don't go to class, you skip class, you don't do all the assignments, you're likely to reap uh, a spare grade, a lousy grade. I learned that a few times going through school. Or take marriage, for example. If you sow sparingly in marriage, if you don't invest very much time or care or communication or romance, you'll ev eventually reap a marriage that's spare. A marriage that's cold or distant, maybe even broken. Or take something as, as frivolous as golf, for example. Golf. I golf once or twice a year. And it's always frustrating. I get so frustrated playing golf. Because I'm lousy at it. But it's actually exactly what I should expect. Because I don't invest in golf. I don't practice. So I sow sparingly. I'm going to reap sparingly. I should understand that. It's certainly true in the financial realm. Everyone in the room probably is investing right now in some sort of long-term re retirement uh, financial vehicle. And we know that if we, the more we sow now, the more we're going to reap later. That's how it works. And the Bible teaches that it holds true in the spiritual realm as well. In one of his most famous parables, the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus compares living in the eternal kingdom of God with servants who have been entrusted with resources by their master. Think CEO and employees. One of the servants receives one talent of money, another receives two, and another five. The one with the two talents immediately invests those talents and doubles them. He has four. The one who has five invests them, and he doubles them, that he has ten. And the master says to those two servants, well done, good and faithful servants. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. But the guy who got the one talent was afraid. And so he buried the talent in the ground. And when the master returned, he took the one talent out, gave it back to him, and said, I was afraid. I, would, I didn't lose anything. Here's your one talent back. And Jesus says in his story, that master says to that servant, you wicked and lazy servant. Take away his one talent. Give it to the one who has ten. Jesus is teaching us that we have been entrusted with God's resources. With God's own resources. And he wants us to invest those resources boldly in his eternal kingdom. Paul is teaching the Corinthian church here that if they sow sparingly, that is if they refuse to share their blessings, to share their wealth with their brothers and sisters in need in Jerusalem, they will also reap sparingly. Now this is a spiritual warning he's giving them. He also is telling them that if they sow generously, if they learn the grace of generosity, they will reap generously. This is a spiritual promise. We're going to come back to both of those in just a moment. So that's the first thing, the law of the harvest. Secondly, we see here the root of generosity. Paul's teaching them about the root of generosity. Back to my son in that little paper flower, I ask a question that I have not as of yet answered. How could my young son, just six or seven years old, see an opportunity for generosity that I could not see? Here's the answer. He wasn't thinking with his pocket. He was thinking with his heart. He wasn't thinking with his pocket. He was thinking with his heart. Now, we tend to think that generosity is directly related to, maybe even dependent on, how much we have in our pocket. 
right? That's kind of how we're taught. That's what we assume, uh, that our generosity is based on how much we have. Our generosity is based on how much we earn, how much we have in the bank. My guess is that most of us have at one time or another had this thought. You know, if I just had a little more, if I just would get that next promotion, if my business would just turn a little more profit, then I could be more generous. Or we assume that people who have more resources than we have find it easier to be generous because they have more. Well, these, are, these things are not true. Not at all true. My son's entire net worth that morning, his entire net worth was $5. And he was prepared, fully prepared, to invest 60% of his entire net worth on a paper flower to give to his mom. Why? Because he wasn't thinking with his pocketbook. He wasn't thinking with his checkbook. He wasn't thinking with his account balance. He was thinking with his heart. Generosity does not begin with money. It begins with the heart. Verse 7, Paul says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, my guess is most of us in this room I have heard that verse many, many times in our lives. And my, I equally would guess that many of us have not yet really grasped what Paul is teaching here. Now here at Chapel Street, we try to teach and model what this is teaching us about generosity. Um, but so often I think this is what we think. We think we are to give because we're supposed to. We give because it's our religious obligation to do so. And we feel vaguely guilty about our level of giving. And sometimes we think of giving kind of like we think of going to the dentist. We know we should do it, but we really kind of don't want to. Now, I want you to know that God does expect and want us to be generous. He does. But Paul says he does not want us to be reluctantly generous. I want to talk for a moment about a word we've all heard, maybe in church growing up, maybe for many, many years. The word is tithe. The tithe, we've all know, heard that word. Back in the Old Testament, the tithe was the expectation and the law of God for his people. The first tenth of everything, animals, cattle, corn, crops, money, the first tenth of everything belonged to God. That's the tithe. However, when we get to the New Testament, the tithe is never mentioned as a requirement for the followers of Jesus. Okay? Some scholars believe it's assumed, but it's never mentioned. The standard before us in the New Testament as the followers of Christ is generously. The tithe in the Old Testament, generously in the New Testament. Now I would ask you, which is the higher standard? Now, just what I think is, this is just me, what I've learned from people through the years and from my own life, that the 10% level of generosity is right about the threshold of blessing, the threshold of joy, the threshold when, 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 when we become generous. That's just my theory. But what Paul is trying to teach is that generosity begins in the heart. Now, what if you look at and you do a mental audit of your own generous, generosity and you think, boy, I, 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 I'm, I'm way short of that. Maybe you haven't really gotten started yet. And some of you are already there and you know exactly what I'm talking about with the threshold of generosity. But if you haven't really gotten started yet, here's what you do. Start with your heart. Don't start with your money. Don't wonder what you can afford. Start with your heart. The first question to ask is, do I want to be generous? Do I want to grow in generosity? If your answer honestly is no, then make that a matter of prayer. Lord, open my heart. Help me to understand what you're calling me to. If your answer is yes, then you just get started somehow. And I've told people many times over the years, just start with something small. A dollar a week. Five dollars a week. Use our, our online giving um, opportunity where you can just set the number in there. Set it at five dollars. and Let it roll for a while. And then after a month, add another five dollars. Let it roll for a while. I can, if you do that, I can promise you two things. I can absolutely promise you two things. First, if you get started, you will want to keep increasing that amount. And secondly, you will be surprised what God does in your heart as you become more generous. 
It's just how he has made us. Paul wants us to understand that generosity doesn't begin with our money. It begins in our heart. It begins with what we love, who we love, what we're devoted to, what we care about, who we worship. It's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, no one can serve two masters. For either you will hate one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now here's the point. If I am reluctant when it comes to generosity, then I don't have a money problem, I have a heart problem. If something tenses up in you when I'm talking about generosity and money and so forth, you don't have a money problem, you might have a heart problem. I think this is why Paul writes to the Corinthian church about these issues. He already knows they have a heart problem. He knows they're reluctant in their generosity. So he's doing a little spiritual heart surgery on his brothers and sisters in Corinth. The third thing we see that Paul teaches here is the promise of abundance. Promise of abundance. Uh, I've told this story before, some of you may remember it, but for the first five years or so of uh, our marriage, I kept our checkbook. Remember checkbooks? My boys have never even seen a checkbook. They've never used one. They don't want others to write a check. But most of us grew up writing checks, you know, and then keeping that little ledger, you know. So I kept our checkbook. And um, my, wife, my wife didn't know this when she married me, but uh, I was 28 when we got married. So for years, when I kept my own checkbook, I just rounded off every check when I recorded it. So if I wrote a check for $24.95, I'd just round it off to $25. And if I wrote a check for $24.03, I'd write it off to $24. I figured in the end it will all come out, right? So about five years into our marriage, oh, and the other thing I did is I, uh, when we get our bank statements, I never would compare them because there's just lots of numbers and stuff. So I would just keep them. I'd put them in a box and stack them up in order. I kept them, but I didn't open them. So something happened about five years in our marriage where she needed to check something. So she, fit, she went through. The first thing she found out was I hadn't opened any of those. Not a good thing. Uh, and then she found out I rounded off. Still not a good thing. And then she discovered when she went through all the numbers and took her days, she found out we had $700 more in our checking account than we thought because of interest over those five years. And I said to her, see, my system works. And I haven't kept it since then. Uh, <laughs> verse 8 says, And God is able to bless you abundantly. God is able to bless you abundantly. Now, when he, there's another translation. This is NIV, but there's another translation called the English Standard Version, ESV. Actually uh, does a better job uh, communicating clearly the Greek that Paul uses here. And the way that translation reads is, God is able to make all grace abound to you. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. I want to look carefully at this verse, almost phrase by phrase. God is able. The word able there is the Greek word for power, dunamis, from which we got our word dynamite. God is able. He is powerful enough to bless you Literally, to make all grace abound to you. The word abound is the word for abundance. It means overflowing, more than enough. So you put all those together as God's grace is so great, so abundant, so much more than you can ever wish for, deserve, or understand, and it explodes in your life, dunamis, power, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, Paul uses the same Greek word three different times, for all, in three different ways. It's as if he's writing in all caps now. That's the impact. He's shouting this. So God's grace is poured out abundantly so that you have all that you need at all times, in all ways, so that you will abound in every good work. Here's the point he's trying to make to the Corinthians. God is abundant. He's abundant. His grace in Christ is abundant. It's more than enough. It's overflowing. And he's poured out this grace on you. God's grace abounds to you so that you will become abundant. I told the people last night at Mill Creek, here's something to try this week. Someday somebody says, hey, how are you doing today? You say, I'm abundant. 
they will look at you kind of strange, then you can explain. He wants to know, us to know that because God is abundant, we are to abound. In what? In every good work. So God promises abundance. Abundant what? Abundant money, car stuff? No, that's not what he's talking about. Abundant grace. Overflowing provision for our needs. Notice, you'll have what you need, not what you want. Big difference. Abundant contentment. Abundance in good works. It's a promise. Years ago, I came across... Um, a church in Oklahoma. It was in Owasso, Oklahoma. First Christian church of Owasso, Oklahoma. And their pastor gave that congregation a money-back guarantee. He said, if you commit yourself to generosity, to, to giving 10%, he used that, that, that level, 10% of your income over the next 90 days, and if you are not blessed with God's abundant promise, we'll refund all your money. No questions asked. So I talked to Jeff this week, and, and we kind of agreed. We want to offer you the same guarantee. If you commit 10% of your resources over the next 90 days and do not experience God's abundant blessing in your life, that church in Oklahoma will refund all your money. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Don't tell Jeff I, I said that because we did not talk about that. The promise is abundance. The fourth thing we see in this passage Paul teaches is the power of generosity. The power of generosity. Verse 10. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed. And will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Again, let's go phrase by phrase. He who supplies Seed. Who is that? Who supplies the seed? God. God is the supplier of all things. Everything belongs to him. He who supplies seed will supply and increase your store of seed. Now what's he saying here? Is Paul saying God is promising to give you more money if you're generous? To give you that raise? You're going to win the lottery? No. That's not what he's saying. But what he is saying is that we will be content with less than we thought. That we will see more and more opportunity to be generous and we'll find that we have more than enough. He will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Here Paul's talking about gospel impact. We talk about this every week at Chapel Street. That you'll experience grace, grow in faith and make an impact where you are. So if you have given anything at all to Chapel Street Church, our general fund, our Serve the World Fund, anything at all over the last, let's say, year. Right now, you are having an impact, for example, on some ministries inside our walls. Uh, Shepherd's Heart Food Pantry, right downstairs from this room. A thousand people every week, every uh, month, come through chap the, the Chapel Street Shepherd's Heart Ministry. And they know that this church cares about them because Jesus cares about them. Or our Buddy Break Ministry to Families with Special Needs. A hundred of every month or so, a hundred of those children and their families are cared for at Kesslinger campus. Or our students today serving in Milwaukee or Mexico or Toronto or Ecuador are there because many of you have supported them in going. There's a church in the Czech Republic growing today because of your generosity. There's a home for adult men with special needs in Ukraine established by a woman who grew up, who, who, lived, who was a part of this church family because you were generous. There's a ministry in Africa called uh, Hope for Life. That where, where Amanda Good, a young woman who grew up in our church family, serves. I may see her for a day this summer. And we have helped build a building for homeless kids in Rwanda. There's a life water, which is putting freshwater wells across sub-Saharan Africa because you, as individuals and as a church family, have been generous. The Bible is being translated into a language in Indonesia where God's word has never existed before because you picked a verse on the wall a few months ago so that that could happen. God is using your generosity, our generosity, to produce greater and greater harvest. That's how it works in God's economy. Then he says, you will be enriched in every way. Talking about more than finances here. Enrichment of the heart, enrichment of gratitude, enrichment of contentment, enrichment of joy. 
so that you can be generous on every occasion. Paul is saying that generosity is kind of like a muscle. The more it's used, the more it grows stronger. And the more it's used, the more you see other opportunities for generosity. Generosity tends to beget more generosity. That's what we saw in the video from the Czech Republic. And all of it will result, Paul says, in thanksgiving to God. Now, here's what Paul is saying. Here's what I believe the New Testament is teaching us. This is just the way I say it. Generosity lies at the heart of everything good God wants to do in us and in his kingdom. Let me say it again. Generosity, properly understood, lies at the heart of everything good God wants to do in us and in his kingdom. The gospel is generous, God is generous, and it always creates generous people. So what is generosity anyway? The definition I'd like to use is generosity is freedom from smallness of heart. Generosity is freedom from smallness of heart. See, God doesn't want something from us. He wants something for us. Freedom from smallness of heart. Years ago, and many of you will remember this, we had a relationship with a church in Russia. We called it our sister church, Transfiguration Baptist Church in Samara, Russia. We sent several teams over there to visit. We contributed funds. They helped them... uh, Um, expand their sanctuary, much like we did with the church in the Czech Republic. And when I was over there uh, visiting and preaching, I I had many conversations with their pastor, a wonderful man named Viktor Ryagozov. And Pastor Viktor told me many stories about how the church in Russia had struggled through persecution, uh, where the government had, you know, would prevent them from a building permit to expand or would actually tear down part of their building to say that because they were in violation of some code, where the government would, would uh, deny the children of prominent believers opportunities to go to university, where some people were harassed and thrown in prison for no other reason than they were a prominent believer in the church. Story after story like that. And then he told this story. He told me one time that the, he said the worst thing the government ever did The most pain ever created by the government for their church family was that the government passed a law that prohibited charitable giving to your church. A law that forbade giving to your church. He said, our people were in pain because it robbed them of joy. I never forgot that because I wondered, would we react the same way in our culture? If our government told us we could no longer give, for kingdom purposes. It was illegal. Would we experience that as a pain, as suffering, or as great relief? The two challenges we have for you this week as you think about the grace of generosity are are these. First, every day this week, spend a few moments, beginning of the day, after your time of gratitude, with just considering your heart. Consider your heart. Free, when it comes to resources, finances, and so forth, or fearful. Consider your heart open to share or closed and holding on to what you see as yours tightly. Just consider your heart. And the second thing is, this might be the fun thing, uh, find a way to be secretly generous every day. Find a way to be secretly generous every day. Write a check, give a gift, Surprise someone, and just watch what God does in your heart through generosity. Let's bow as I close. Lord, thank you so much for your word, this ancient letter to an ancient church that reminds us really of who we are today. It's so relevant. I think deep down we want to be more generous. We know your grace is abundant. We know we have more than enough, but sometimes we are afraid. We fear. We fear we won't have enough, or we allow our hearts to be seduced by a culture that teaches us to love things more than we love you. Teach us this grace called generosity and set our hearts free. It's in your name that we pray.